All right, hello, welcome to Convict Inc. I'm your host, Robert Rosso, and today we are going to talk about, well, actually, who is the star of this? Uh, or the featured mobster? Would it be Jimmy Ida or would it be Pino? Huh, I'm going to say Jimmy Ida. Let's go there. Okay, um, please hit the, uh, the subscribe button. Um, I need all the people I can get, and I appreciate all of you that have already subscribed to this channel. Um, okay, let's get down to it. Okay, so as I've said many times, from 2003, January two, let's just say uh, January 2003 to January of 2007, I was at USP Lewisburg. During that time was kind of like, um, uh, I guess you can say one of the highlights in my uh, prison career. So what I mean by that is I was involved in, in the politics. Uh, I was the, the leader of a, of a white prison gang. I had uh, a huge store, gambling operation, et cetera. So let me, let me be a little bit more specific. We actually got to Lewisburg, and I say we, that's me and four other of my brothers at the time, which were Dirty White Boys. So October 2002, we're transferred from Leavenworth to Lewisburg. We stay in the hole until January. We're let out in January, and the staff decided to put, there's five of us, each one of us, in a block by ourselves. I was put into F block. F block was the smallest unit in Lewisburg at the time, I think still is. Uh, like four whites, it was uh, predominantly African-Americans from Washington, D.C., and a couple of Italians and some few Puerto Ricans. Uh, the leader, a shot caller for us when we got there, actually, he became a shot caller when we arrived was Billy. Well, I'm not going to give the last name. Billy lasted a hot minute, and then he pissed the warden off, and then the the warden put him in the shoe and then ultimately threw him in the SMU program, which is a special management unit. That's take that's just uh, stay in your cell all day with just a mattress. That's how it was at the time for 18 months. So when Billy went away, that's when I got the reins to the car, keys to the car, whatever you want to say. I had, I lived on the second floor in F block. I had a window right outside my cell. I lived all the way in the back. When you looked out the window, it was like looking at a postcard. Um, Pennsylvania is beautiful. This was a mountainous area. So in the wintertime when it snowed, you can see the snow in the mountains and houses with little chimneys. So you can see over the wall from the second tier. And I just loved that view. I mean, it, it meant everything to me. And I really did have the best cell on the block as well. Just the location of it. It was really a nice cell. And I hooked it up. I put some extra shelves on it and stuff because I ended up running a store. Now, for you that don't know what a store is, most of you do. Um, so there's prison commissary. I go buy a bunch of commissary, a few hundred dollars worth, and then I sell it for a 50% markup. Guys either pay me in currency, which is postal stamps, drugs, or they give me back um, a commissary. So if a guy runs a $100 bill up with me, he's gonna give me $150 back. I had that store about six months before it really, well, three, any, any store in prison, I always, I always say, give it three months and it'll start, it'll really start turning itself over and producing income. Six months into mine, uh, you know, I was over $700 a month profit and at the height of it, it was over $1,500. I also had a gambling ticket. So what I did was I didn't have my own ticket. There was a couple guys that had tickets and I volunteered to pass them out. So I would get tickets from other blocks and then I would pass them out to guys and then I would run a freeze out. So I would run my own gambling ticket based off their their gambling lines. And it was a, it was a credit gambling operation. So that was just, just wildly successful. So my cell looked like Walmart Supercenter, just, just shrunk down. There wasn't anything in that commissary that I didn't have it myself. 
Everything that was in that commissary was in my cell. My cellies, um, most of the time it was, well, there was one, uh, Billy, I'm not going to say his last name, I don't have permission yet. The other one won't care, it's Chris Kahn. Uh, they didn't, the deal was they could move in, they didn't have any property. I don't mean no property, I mean they couldn't have a locker. My cellies had a cardboard box under the bed, but they had free reign to anything they wanted in that cell. I think Billy didn't go to the chow hall for six months. And I mean, just, just abused his privilege. <laughs> It's a little scumbag. <laughs> anyway, sorry about it. But for sure, uh, my cellies did really well. And, and I don't think I had a cellie uh, there that didn't want to live with me or like living with me, even though I had a lot of traffic because of the store. And let me tell you, the store ran itself. And what I mean is if Billy or I or Chris or I was not in the cell, I put a, I put a notepad on the desk. And guys can just walk in and grab whatever they want. And they sign their name down or they put the stamps on the table and that was that did guys steal from me sometimes sure not even enough to notice i think one time i was like oh i'm missing something but i'm positive i was getting burned but i was making so much money it did not matter in fact i was making so much money that the unit manager which was name was mr adamai along with other executive staff were doing rounds one day and they came by and they saw myself and they looked in and I had all my shelves was cookies stacked to the ceiling, chips stacked to the ceiling. The lockers were completely full. There's two lockers on top of each other. Behind the bed, there's a space about that big between the bed and the wall. The idea is the guards can come and walk and tap on the bars. I had sodas and the sodas were literally shoulder length. That's how high they were in the back of the cell. Um, so merchandise just wide open. There was no trying to hide it. Running a store is uh, considered a prohibited act. Um, you get a disciplinary for it. Uh, they can, can get you with running a business, whatever. Um, I just went balls to the wall with it. Adam, I came in and said, uh, you're doing way too much. So here's the deal. You're going to start paying your court ordered fine. So at the time I was on what's called FPR refusal or um, financial program refusal. I had a $15,000 fine tacked onto my life sentence that I never wanted to pay. I'm paying it off right now, as a matter of fact, the facts don't I think I'm under five. Anyway, so I didn't have any intentions of paying it. So what I would do is when, when it was, it was paid quarterly, every three months, I'd just make sure I didn't have any money in my account or put it on the phone or whatever. So it would automatically come off our accounts. If it wasn't there, that was it. Um, that limited my commissary spending to only $25 a month, but it didn't matter. I had so much commissary and so many guys going to the store for me. I had, I had started putting uh, merchandise and other people sell to hold for me. Anyway, so Mr. Adam, I came in and he started making me pay hundred dollars a month to run a store. Then there was a guard one time that worked three quarters as fat bastard. And I can say fat because I'm about 40 pounds overweight. Big bastard, okay? Uh, again, I'm not supposed to run a store. So what did he do? Every time he walked in the door, he he, he actually worked the four to, four to uh, 11 shift. He'd put his stuff in the office, shut the door, walk right up to my cell and grab whatever he wanted to eat bag of chips, sodas, candy bars, and leave. Every day he peeled me, every day he did that. And sometimes he would come back and there wasn't a damn thing I can say about it because I was running a business. I was running an illegal store. So uh, yeah, Adam, I made me start paying a fine with the proceeds. Now let me explain that real quick. So I'm selling commissary. Guys are now paying me in stamps, which are currency. So <clears throat> at the time I think it was, uh, uh, 35 cents, uh, a stamp, a 35 cent stamp was worth a dollar. Is that how it went? No, a quarter. <clears throat> it's the, the compound currency. So uh, a book of stamps or 20 stamps was $5. So you would, I would get a hundred books of stamps and I would sell them to somebody for $500. So if I had a hundred books of stamps, then Joe Blow over here would come to me and say, Hey, I'm a gambler or well, he didn't say that, but people would buy stamps to gamble, to get high, to, you know, for drugs. 
or they used them just to spend uh, on vegetables, uh, stuff around in prison. You know, uh, things cost money and stamps are the currency. So guys would send me $500 to my account and then every month, a uh, hundred of that five would come off and go towards my fine. So that's how that works. Okay, so I can't stress it enough. Uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm bragging too much. I was rolling, okay? Uh, doing real well. My life was doing good as far. I was like a prison pimp, you know? I mean, I don't think very many people had it better than me. Well, Miles Coker, um, uh, what's the guy out of, out of Florida, Florida Louis, uh, the cocaine uh, guy? I guess he was doing really good. Um, you know, there was, there was guys with big money there, but I'm just saying I was bidding. I, I was doing it. So everything was sweet as far as prison goes. And um, I started getting high. And I, I was sober for, for quite a while. And then I, I started drinking. And one night I got drunk and I went to the hole. Well, I had the big store going. I survived it. I went 30 days and Billy and one of my bros, Dusty, and my neighbor, Tommy Reynolds, took care of it. They all took care of it for me and it ran. I got back out and uh, I went to the hole again. This time when I went to the hole, so I, I went on a drinking and then a dirty. It was back to back like that. When I got out of the hole, the, ne the next time, uh, they moved me to a different block. Now I had over a thousand dollars with the commissary and, and I wanted my cell. That was my cell. And yes, we played that. And everybody on the compound knew, especially in the block, knew it was my cell. But in my but who they put in my cell was a 70-year-old Italian man by the name of da -da -da, Giuseppe. Oof, I don't want to say this. Schifoletti, Schifoletti, aka Pino. Who was Pino? Uh, Wikipedia has him. He was born in 1938 and is a former prominent member of the D, uh, D. Cavante crime family since the 1980s. Heavily involved in labor racketeering and extortion. He was the boss of one of the Jersey crime families. And I'm sorry, you know what? I, I'm really mostly familiar with just the five families in New York. Uh, D. Uh, Cavacante, I, I think that's how you say it. So I don't mean to uh, offend anybody by the way I pronounce it. Uh, but anyway, so Pino moved in. A mild-mannered guy indeed, he still played boss man in that guy. Um, one of my neighbors was a guy named Jimmy Ida. Jimmy Ida was a, a, a capo of the Genovese, or uh, yeah, was he Genovese or Lucchese? Um, a family in New York, uh, Genovese. And uh, he was the acting boss of the Genovese family for, for a minute too. I got along really, really good with Jimmy. And uh, Jimmy, Pino was Jimmy's friend. Now, I was put in, a, in D block first, and I was, I, was, I was miserable. I hated it. It was dirty. The cells were smaller. And like I said, F block was just the best block in the joint. And I had the best cell in the best, uh, in the, in the best cell block. Of course, I wanted my cell back. Plus, I had dug out the center block walls. I had dug out some center blocks, so I had stash spots for stamps. Dope, knives. So, uh, yeah, that was important to me. Plus the store. It was on the second tier, three tiers, all the way in the back. So I'm getting customers from both tiers. It's the prime spot. That view meant everything to me. I had the TV situation set up. I mean, it was just the F block and that cell was my world. So I go to Pino when I get out. First of all, when he moved in, everybody told him that it's my cell. And he just kind of said, okay. I went out to the yard uh, when I got out and I introduced myself to him and he said, yeah, he, when he finds a cell, he's gonna move. Now, I didn't realize when he said that, what he was really saying was when he find, found a cell that suited him. F block, as I said, was a really small block. Cells didn't come over, especially white cells and he's Italian, but he's considered white. Uh, they didn't come open much. Guys didn't really go to the hole that much in F block, uh, especially white or white guys. So I, it, I just didn't snap to the fact that he was saying, you know, I'm going to move when I get a cell. Um, he was, and he, he was trying to stay in F block, which of course I would too. 
plus Jimmy Ida's there, Joe Joe Russo is there, Joe Monty is there, the other, the other mob guys. So yeah, of course he wanted to stay there, and I don't blame him for that, but that doesn't take away the fact that I wanted my cell. Well, a week went on, two weeks went on, and I went to the yard, and I called Jimmy Ida with Pino, and I said, hey, listen, I want my cell. And there's knives in those walls. You know, I thought I'd shake them up a little bit. A lot of guys, uh, like I said in some of my last videos, a lot of the mob guys are model inmates in prison. So I figured that would put some fear in him, like he didn't want to be around no knives. I also had a syringe in the wall. Um, it, it didn't really, he seemed more annoyed. Well, my celly Billy later on finds out that, uh, you know, it doesn't look like Pino's really trying to go anywhere. As a matter of fact, he got really, really comfortable in that cell. Meanwhile, I am just effing miserable down in D-Block, loud. My store's gone. I'm, I'm, I'm mad at myself now. I'm starting to get high a lot and drink all the time. So I was just miserable. I was a miserable fuck. Billy goes and threatens Pino. Now, there's probably, you know, 30 to 50 uh, mob guys, probably 30 made. But Pino's a boss. And all those other guys, it doesn't matter what family, they're going to give that guy respect. So uh, he went and, uh, you know, he didn't beat him up, but, he, you know, he threatened him and kind of shoved him and said, you know, you got to get going. Well, Jimmy Ida, I, I believe, heard that uh, and took offense to it. I just, I just talked to Billy earlier. I, he, we talked, and he told me the story. I think Jimmy Ida, I, I couldn't have this wrong, tried to put a jacket on Billy saying Billy was no good, uh, you know, like a, like a rat or snitch jacket or something because Billy offended Pino. Enter Tommy Reynolds and Benny Gertano. Both from New York, both from the Bath Avenue area. Benny wasn't made, his father's made guy. Uh, I know his brothers are now too, anyway. Uh, Tommy was not made, but he was part of the Bath Avenue crew. Uh, there's a book called Mob Over Miami. You guys might want to read it. Tommy's in there. Uh, his body counts five. Tommy and Jimmy, uh, Tommy and uh, um, Benny grew up together in the same area. They were, they were good friends and Sally's. Well, Benny, uh, he didn't really care about, I mean, it's not that he didn't care about mob guys, like I said, his dad was, but he wasn't going to watch his tongue because this person was that, because you were a gang member, you were a mob guy. Or anything. And he was a really, really funny guy. Uh, I liked Benny. He was my he was my dude. A day came when Benny and Jimmy Ida had words over Pino and Billy and Billy, my celly. Um, and the argument got heated and, and Jimmy Ida threatened Benny. Um, I don't remember exactly how it went, but uh, Benny said, fuck you. <laughs> now, this is a, a acting underboss, but a capital and a well-respected one. Like I said, of, of the uh, Genovese, God, did I say Genovese or Casey? Oof, Genovese. Yeah, right. Um, but Jimmy had a lot of respect uh, in prison and on the street, from what I understand. So, one day, they were coming in from Morning Wreck. Some words were exchanged. Benny got up in uh, Jimmy Ida's face. Now, Jimmy Ida is about 70, late 60s. Benny, mid 30s. Jimmy Ida was with a guy named uh, uh, Johnny. Uh, oh, Billy, we just talked about that. My me and Billy talked about this earlier. He was a mob guy, but um, underling, soldier, whatever, uh, quiet, kind of stayed out of the way. He was walking in to the metal detector. Then he says something to Jimmy to turn around. Jimmy Ida swings, a swing, swing his weight now. Kind of skimmed Benny, and Benny, bam, hits the old man in the face. The guy next to him jumps on Benny. Tommy Reynolds jumps on him. They all four went to the hole. And again, this is over my cell situation. And, and let me go to that real quick. So 
Administration found out, got wind of, of, of me, or me and my guys pressing up on Pino and said that I, and wouldn't allow me to ever move back into F, F block again. And uh, it, it was a real serious situation um, where somebody even told Adam I, the unit manager, that I had was gonna was gonna hit him, was gonna stab him, or try to kill him. I was pulled up by staff and uh, and warned about that. And uh, it, it, like I said, it, it was a, it was it was a serious deal, and it was all because Pino wouldn't leave my cell. And uh, that caused these other guys to go to the go to the shoe and get in a fight. Now, what these guys don't know, and nobody really knows to this day, I think I think Dusty did, is uh, I went in there and got those guys out. And uh, what I mean by got them out, um, the AW at the time, his name was Estrada, and he was a convict's warden. This guy came in and uh, on his first week. He said that this was a penitentiary, a man's penitentiary, and uh, he didn't care if we assaulted people or handled business, as long as we did it between eight and four, Monday through Friday, not on the weekends and not with knives. So he sanctioned assaults for gang members, straight up. The Bureau of Prisons Warden, M. Estrada, sanctioned gang assaults. And it's the day he said that, the next day, I sent some guys, boom, it was just at, all, all beasts were getting taken care of. Everybody was getting hit. So Estrada, uh, what was the deal? I pulled up on him, whatever. I forgot how I went down, but I pulled up on him and pulled my juice card, so to speak, because uh, uh, I had a couple of, of, of incidents happen where some guys got hit and he told me to slow it down. And uh, I brought it up. I said, I slowed it down. Will you let these guys out? This is an old man. Nothing's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. But all around the compound, the rumor was that Jimmy Ida wasn't going to stand for that. Jimmy Ida wasn't going to um, let Benny punch him and get away with it, that his family would be killed, this, that, and the other. And uh, that just never did happen. Um, as a matter of fact, I know that Benny went and, uh, went and had some words with Jimmy after about that, about hearing rumors that he was going to get assaulted or his family was going to get hurt. And um, Jimmy never spoke a word about it again. So, anyway, well, it kind of didn't have like a, it didn't have a, a climax to that story, did it? It was just kind of this way. But that's what happened. And that was um, Mob Boss Pino from the De Cavacante crime family out of New Jersey. Again, sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Really, I don't. And uh, Jimmy Ida, Capo. Acting un once acting underboss of the Lucases and uh, Benny Giratano and my good friend Tommy Reynolds. Okay, guys, maybe tomorrow I'll do Tommy Karate. I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to stick with the mob thing for a minute. Peace out.